Open our minds, O Lord, that we may know you. Open our hearts, that we may love you. Open our lives, that we may take your love to the world. Amen. Our readings for today have much to say to a people in transition, wondering what God has in store for us next. A prophet, nearing the end of his tenure, passes on his mantle to a new prophet. A rabbi sets his face toward the place of his death and resurrection and calls the people along the way to follow him keeping their eyes focused on the road ahead of them instead of what lies behind. An inveterate letter writer reminds his readers of how easy it can be to fall prey to the impulse to grab everything for oneself and despise one's neighbor, and calls them back to root themselves in the spirit of love. And a Hebrew poet turns to God to find the path of life, giving thanks for the goodly heritage that is all around. Each of these has wisdom for us who are wondering what is around the corner, what we need to do to prepare for our journey, and where our guidance and sustenance will come from. Elijah and Elisha could not be more different as men and as prophets. Elijah is, as scholar Daniel Hawk writes, the quintessential outsider. He's irascible, cranky. He works on the periphery of Israel. He scrounges for food and hangs with the poorest of the poor. He is persistent in his critique of power and idolatry within the royal household of Israel. And Elijah is also a loner, which perhaps is one of the reasons he is so exhausted at the point we meet him in our story for today. Elisha, on the other hand, is wealthy. He owns 12, 12 yoke of oxen, plowing acreage with which only the rich could afford. And Elisha is not an outsider. After Elijah is taken up by a chariot of fire, Elisha pursues the call of a prophet, not on the margins, but in the midst of the halls of power. He even heals a commander of an army. These two prophets are polar opposites. Yet they have both been called by God to do the same work of calling Israel back to faithfulness and justice. Elisha supplies what Elijah lacks. Elijah lays groundwork that Elisha perhaps could not have laid. There's a bit of the bad cop, good cop thing going on here. But taken together, they form the perfect prophet. It's interesting that to follow Elijah, God did not choose a carbon copy. Rather, God chose a prophet with his own unique personality and gifts. In part, this is because each new stage requires new approaches. But mostly, I think it is a reflection of the deep mystery that each person, as different as they are, is made in the image of God, not as duplicates off of an assembly line, but as unique, precious children of God. And that applies to us. We are, at the same time, absolutely enough, just the way we are, and at the same time, we know we do not possess everything we need. What we lack will have to be supplied by others in the present and in the, in the future. So this is a good reminder for us as our rector Jeff prepares to leave this community 
to shepherd the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. It will be tempting to want to replicate exactly what we have now because it is so, so good. We will not want Elisha to replace Elijah or Elijah to replace Elisha, whichever way around. We will want a carbon copy. When we lose something we love, it is only natural. And we're not sure we want what lies ahead because what we have seems just right. I wonder if this is behind that impulse of the followers who told Jesus that first they needed to bid farewell to family before joining him. Perhaps they needed to have some last hold on the past, some closure before they could embrace this new thing. And I'm not sure why Jesus rebukes them. Perhaps he senses that they are not really ready to let go of what they have known. And unlike Jesus' followers in our gospel, did you notice that Elisha is allowed to go back to his family and take care of his obligations before heading out with Elijah? And I'm not sure what the difference is, but perhaps it's because those following Jesus in the gospel had already had time to consider the consequences of their choice. They had been hanging around and they said, we want to follow you. Whereas Elisha was caught completely by surprise. In both cases, it is what lies ahead that is key. Where we have been is important and foundational, and where we are going with Jesus is even more the point. Our faces are to be set on Jerusalem, that is, on where God is leading us. But right now, we're in that in-between, what we call liminal space. In some ways, where we are is with Elisha, going back to the people he loves, feasting together at a fine table laden with food, and, as I imagine, sharing stories about their life together before he sets out to follow Elijah and his new path as a prophet. So right now, we are remembering, rightly, the joys we have shared, the sorrows born and eased by carrying them together. We are, rightly, thanking God for what we have had and mourning what we will lose. So given all of that, here is another important thing. Can we think of ourselves not as Elisha's family left behind, but as Elisha himself, the one who is being called forward by God into a new and transforming future? Can we see that we are not the father that needs to be buried, or the family being bad farewell? but the followers who are being invited to join Jesus in the greatest work of our lives. What would it mean to make this shift in perspective? For we are indeed the ones on the road with Jesus. There is work for us to do. There are women who need to be supported and honored in the difficult decisions they have to make about their bodies and their lives. There are people terrorized by weapons of war that no ordinary citizen should be able to wield in the marketplace, maybe not anywhere. There are people whose skin color or sexuality means that their lives still do not matter. There are prisoners to set free and a wounded multitude to comfort. So every week we gather here as Jesus followers to take into ourselves the real and powerful body of Christ, 
not only for solace, but for strength, as it says in Eucharistic Prayer C. To receive Christ's body is to say yes to setting our face toward Jerusalem, that is, toward a mysterious, unsettling future. To gather here around Christ's table is to say to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And look at what Christ has already been doing in our midst. Do you think he will abandon us as we set our hands to the plow? Let our prayer be always that of the psalmist. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And in your right hand there are pleasures forevermore.